Well, I am on, but I don't have seem to have any video coming through. There we go. Hey, good morning, everyone. This is Dr. Bill's World Bible School, and thank you for joining me this morning on Take Another Look as we are looking at the book of Revelation verse by verse. And um, uh, we're finding out what we can see in these lessons. Good morning, Carol Anderson. Good to see you joining us this morning. Uh, there are others who have joined already. And um, <clears throat> we're glad that you are here. And uh, so I want to continue and just say that uh, this is an ongoing series of lessons where we're taking a spiritual journey through the book of Revelation, verse by verse. In these lessons, I am sharing with you what I believe Holy Spirit has shown me. And so it's very exciting uh, because if you're joining me for the first time, we're looking at the events surrounding the Apostle John as he experiences a new dimension of the heavenly realms of the father's mind. That's very important that we understand that. Good to see Dr. Fay joining us this morning um, and, and others. Uh, and as we look at this, uh, just keep in mind that I'm sharing all of these truths from you, these, these, uh, uh, these concepts, these precepts, these, these uh, uh, symbolic messages, these metaphors, I'm sharing them with you from the idea that this is the revelation of Jesus Christ or the unveiling of the anointed one. Good to see Linda Routley, one of our WBSU students, joining us this morning. Amen. And uh, so uh, how I define revelation is the unveiling of the Father's heart. So hear what I'm saying this morning. Pay attention to the scriptures, to uh, the, uh, the the evidence that I'm sharing with you that is relevant to these lessons. So uh, good to see Gabriella joining us this morning. Uh, so as we get started this morning in this in today's lesson, uh, let's continue to see what John sees and hears next as he shows us how to operate uh, from the heavenly realm while ministering in the earthly realm. In reality, there's only one realm, but for sake of identification, we will uh, allude to that. Now, uh, we're just looking today at Revelation 19, verses 6 through 8. I know we ended last week with verse 6, but verse 6, I kind of want to bring into this and tie this together. And so it says here in the New King James, And I heard, as it were, the voice of a great multitude, as the sound of many waters, and as the sound of mighty thunderings, saying, Alleluia, for the Lord, some translators say this should say our lord god omnipotent reigns let us be glad and rejoice and give him glory for the marriage of the lamb has come and his wife has made herself ready and to her it was granted to be arrayed in fine linen clean and bright for the fine linen is the righteous acts of the saints now a lot of symbolism here because we know the book of Revelation is a book of symbolisms. Uh, and, and, and let me just show you how true that really is. Just like the Hebrew language that has 22 letters in its alphabet, every letter has a numerical value, has a, 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 uh, a, a, a musical note uh, value, and also has a, 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 a numeric value. And, and so in the Greek language, we also see that people could understand things best through pictures uh, and, and metaphors, symbolisms. And so when the scriptures say that he sent and signified it by his uh, angel to his servant, Servant John signified once again, we've heard this again and again, we know that he's talking about th that it is a symbolic uh, or uh, a symbolic language that has spiritual or uh, pictorial meanings and so on. And so as we look at that, a, uh, it is important that we understand uh, that, that some of these concepts. And so as I share with you today, hear what Holy Spirit is saying to you individually. And as you share this with others, uh, it might be that Holy Spirit is speaking some things to them as well. So very important that we understand that. Okay. Now, <clears throat> as we look here, the starting of chapter nine in this vision began by 
a loud voice as it were or likened unto a voice of a great multitude in heaven and um when we do that uh it's important that we understand that this great voice was the collective voices out of the one voice from the eternal realm also known as the unseen realm and it's important that we understand the reason that there is an unseen realm is because it simply alludes to the fact that you can't see it with your natural eyes uh, as it were uh, i'm not saying that we never can come to a place of spirit soul and body functioning as one and i believe we should uh so that we can uh, see out of, of our being and understand in any realm but i am saying that these voices of the messengers out of the great cloud of witnesses is the many membered body of the one eternal christ within now this is why uh it's, it, it is an impossibility for you to ever be alone uh, to, uh, simply because your true origin is of spirit. And as spirit, you are one individual uh, uh, portion of that many membered body as the creation of the Godhead. So I think that's an extremely important thing for us to embrace and to realize. And as John heard this sound, uh, to him, it was as if he heard the voice of a great multitude, which presented itself to him as the sound of many waters and the sound of mighty thunderings. Now, for me, the sound of many waters presents a picture of the ripples in a body of water when a stone is thrown across it. We've all seen that, whether you've seen it on television or you've actually done that. Uh, as a, a, a young uh, uh, child or as an adult, as it were. Um, and and it, it could be like a waterfall when it's crashing down upon the rocks and one can hear the echo of its sound. So again, to me, this presents the idea of the peeling back of layers of revelation to your mind when you hear the many pounding waters or voices, as it were, and it becomes symbolic of the voice of many waters speaking to your soul. And so I just thank you. Uh, I, I just thank you for joining me today, everybody. Good to see Francis Hammers joining us this morning. Rita Campbell uh, joining us this morning. Uh, it, it's just it's just good for us to understand that this is the opening of the mystery of this great salvation of the rescuing of all mankind from an incorrect mindset, which has now been unveiled so that we can walk away from mistaken identity back to the mind of our God identity. So in this setting, it seems as if the four living creatures and the 24 elders representing the great cloud of witnesses, again, it's just a symbolism, had been issued a command from the throne within, the throne within here, the throne is here, uh, within for all mankind to awaken everywhere, which includes the millions upon millions who had just escaped from the remains of of the Babylonian mindset of separation from God to give praise and honor and glory to our creator God. This would seem that this action is symbolic of a changing of marching orders or even a change of direction in ministry. Because remember, these people were ministering under an old covenant mindset. And even as they became converts or students of the teachings of Christ, I believe that somehow just like you and I, we've had re religious ideology in our, our, our thinking for all of our lives and we're getting freed from that. But it's also a process that we need to realize is taking place. And so we have a change of direction, a change of marching orders. And as sons of God, who are also the creation of God, who walk in the dominion of the Father, the dominion that he gave us before time began, even before Adam fell, we do not march to the same mindset as those in the old covenant of the law. As the eternal Christ came to sacrifice himself, it was for the purpose of waking up mankind in his memory back to the awareness of the fullness of the mind of the Godhead eternally implanted within us. 
And I think it's really important that we grasp that, that we get a hold of that, that we understand uh, the reality of that. Uh, and, and so in this awakening, we have had a paradigm shift in our awareness to our true God identity. We are those who have determined to stop being led by mistaken identity, which was the self-imposed Adamic mindset that never belonged to the creation of God in the first place. Amen. And we are a kingdom of priests in the eternal Christ, and we have taken charge over the multitudes of God's creation in the form of spreading the unveiled knowledge of the same mind that was in Christ Jesus. That's really exciting and really an important point here today. Writer and commentator J. Preston Eby says, suddenly, wondrously, gloriously, John hears a great and mighty voice, as if a great multitude, and as if as of many waters, and as of, of mighty thundering, saying, Alleluia, for the Lord God omnipotent reigneth, acknowledging in adoration, in adoring praise to a, the new administration of his lordship. Oh, the wonder of it. Uh, now we have now we come to an, an even greater wonder. Not only does the, the vast multitude express their praises to God, but now they speak as to one another, proclaiming with joy and gladness, let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to him. But why? It is is it because the Jews have all returned to Pal Palestine? Is it because we have uh, seen uh, a revived Roman Empire in Europe, and thereby know that the end of the age is at hand? Is it because the in great increase of earthquakes, tsunamis, droughts, wars, uh, immorality, terrorism, and evils, and cat cat catastrophes of all kinds point uh, uh, unerringly to the soon return of the Lord? Is it because the rapture has taken place and we escape the seven years of the reign of Antichrist and this indescribable hell of the great tribulation? No, not at all. It is just because the marriage of the lamb is come and his wife hath made herself ready. And let me just say this. Let me just preface his statement by saying, amen. It is none of those things, but the marriage or the joining of the lamb and the bride as being renewed in one mind. And remember the writings of Colossians 1 verse 21 in the Passion Translation saying, even though you were once distant from him, living in the shadows of your evil thoughts and actions, he reconnected you back to himself. If anything, that the finished work of Christ did, it was exactly that. It reconnected us back to our original state of mind. And to me, that's the marriage of the lamb and the bride, is the reconnecting or the rejoining of the, our minds so that we become one mind and one voice. And, and so for there to be a reason uh, to, to be reconciled or reconnected to God, then we would have at least... Uh, so at some point been connected to him. And, the, and that point is uh, was at creation, which was before time began. Once again, Ephesians 1, 4, the Passion Translation. And he chose us to be his very own, joining us to himself even before he laid the foundation of the universe. And you know that scripture. But the fact is, that he ordained us because of his great love. He marked us with his love, uh, that we would be seen as holy in his eyes with unstained innocence. So the fact uh, is that this point in time was even before he laid the foundation of the universe. Therefore, the eternal Christ is unveiling to John and within us. That's the concept. Second Timothy 1 9 says he in the Passion Translation, he gave us resurrection life uh, for he is our life giver and drew us to himself by his holy calling on our lives. And it wasn't because of any good we have done, but by his divine pleasure and marvelous grace that we that confirmed our union with the anointed Jesus even before time began. What a powerful, powerful verse of scripture 
that is that clarifies even before time begin now you can attempt to label that or tag that uh, as relating to before christ but it doesn't say that and uh, i don't think you can find it translated really in any other way even if words are uh, rearranged to say other than that it was before time began so this literally means before the time of the ages and this wording is also in harmony with other translations such as the new king james and so on so from before time began father god always intended to uh, us to function in any realm just uh, as he truly is first john 1 17 4 17 says as all I, all that jesus is now so are we in this world as he is so are we these are not scriptures just to be thrown around uh, but they are clues of truth which lead us into a greater awareness of his mind that has already been implanted in us so you see the marriage supper must take place and, and we we won't necessarily cover all the scriptures that relate to this today but the marriage supper must take place which is the full the fully uh, u, u, uniting or we could say the full reuniting of his mind in us and the the bride has and is being adorned with the revelation of truth and all the while the groom is has as always been prepared to reconnect with all that cre the, the creation of God there is no doubt about that therefore it is not the evil things around us that is drawing us to the father but it is his consuming fire of his passionate love that is involved in each step we take and truly and turning us gently toward the knowledge of his mind now we want to look at revelation chapter um, um 19 verse 7 and 8 in the passion translation so let's notice here <clears throat> let us rejoice and exalt him and give him glory being because because the wedding celebration of the lamb has come and his bride has made himself ready fine linen shining bright and clear has been given to her to wear and the fine linen represents the righteous deeds of his holy believers so as we look at these verses it would be uh, would appear that some uh, uh, f uh, form of a timeline marriage has arrived where the Lamb of God becomes joined to his bride. So the imagine uh, the imagery of the wedding celebration of the Lamb seems to reinforce the idea of intimacy and express the idea that Jesus shares his love with his bride to be. Now we can say bride to be. So what is that a picture of? When we see bride to be, we have to jump back to the Old Testament where uh, they're seeing some things that is to come, but not embracing them at the moment. We look at Hosea 2 verse 19 in the God's Word translation. It says, Israel, I will make you my wife forever. I will be honest and faithful to you. I will show you my love and compassion. So to make this clearer, we must understand that we have always been joined to the Lord from before the foundation of the universe, just as Ephesians 1, 4 has stated it. Yet in Hosea 2, 9, as the Lord himself speaks to Israel of old, he says, I will make you my wife forever. So it was the fallen mindset of Adam that Israel took on or embraced, which we know is the mindset of, of being separated from God because of sin. And, and that this mistaken, this, this mindset of mistaken identity has been the very deception in the mind of all mankind since Adam. And you know what? That is really so, uh, so uh, uh, important for us to understand. Because again, you are not of Adam. You are of the eternal Christ who lives in you. Therefore, you are not now, nor have you ever been separated from your creator to any degree of the imagination. And when Revelation 19 says his bride has made herself ready, it can be translated from the Aramaic to read his bride loves him. That's so important. 
because love is always the drawing force that brings things together. It's always the, the force that holds things together. And, and so in, in a way, as humanity comes to fall in love with the Lord through understanding his mind, through understanding how he feels about them, uh, that they engage in the path of understanding of what is on God's mind. This is real life on earth which is to know and to understand the same mind that was in Christ Jesus. And Revelation 19, 8 said, fine linen, shining bright and clear, has been given to her to wear, and the fine linen represents the righteous deeds of his holy ones. Notice that the scripture actually defines the concept here and says the fine linen represents the righteous deeds of the holy believers or of his holy believers. It seems that the Aramaic can be translated to read, and the fine linens are the blessings of the holy ones. Listen, because you are the creation of the creator, you are blessed with himself. Oh, yes, I know that we see prosperity, and I'll I'll I think I'll talk about that in this, but, but I, I know we see all of these things, but you are blessed with the creator himself. The blessing is the passionate love of the eternal Christ for his creation. Yet most people think of blessing as relating to prosperity or to money. However, there is no need that could ever arise in your life that your uh, precious father has not thought about. Amen. So the question is this, can you trust your daddy creator to take care of you in all matters pertaining to life and godliness? That's a great question to, to uh, um, look at in your life. Uh, can you really trust him? Now, John hears them shouting their praises of triumph to God. Metaphorically or symbolically, this great system of evil uh, and deception has been de dethroned as far as what is being unveiled in this vision. And so the reality is, is that there is nothing for us to fear. There is nothing for us to, uh, that we need to uh, allow to uh, conquer our minds, to take over our minds, to, um, uh, to literally, um, um, to, to literally uh, pursue our, 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 our mind or to, to, uh, to, to draw our focus away from the eternal Christ. And, and so as we understand this, John hears them shouting their praises of triumph to God. Now, again, uh, I want to say this, there's no system of evil or deception that, uh, uh, except that which has had, has been dethroned as far as what God is being unveiled in this vision. This harlot mindset of Babylon that had deceived uh, so many are now free to fully embrace the knowledge of his life, of the, the life of God. And in John's vision, all the people who catch this unveiled revelation within them, they begin to honor the Lord, even as it is now made clear that they are joined to the Lord in a married union. Again, it's not that they're not joined to the Lord, but it's that they are aware, they realize that. Now, as you are able to discern the sequence of events here, as soon as Babylon falls, the bride makes herself ready for the marriage, which is symbolically referring to the engaging in this already established union with the eternal Christ. Think about it. Uh, you are a person who has alienated yourself from the mind of God by uh, by believing you are separated, by believing that you have an Adamic mindset. And so when this awakening comes, this whole process of life is you being adored, except it is the Lord who is adorning you as he is uh, um, invoking his passionate a consuming fire of love up on you and drawing you little by little, inch by inch, day by day to him. And all of a sudden there's an awakening uh, that the, where this marriage has actually consummated that you realize you have his mind. And so it's referring to this, this symbolic uh, 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 engaging in this already established union with the eternal Christ because of the, because the builder, the blinders are now removed from the mind of mankind and they can see and understand that the creation belongs to the creator. 
So there is a prophetic word in Isaiah 61, 10, uh, which shows us the importance of being secure in your union with the creator. And it says in the Passion Translation, I will sing and greatly rejoice in Yahweh. My whole being vibrates. My whole being vibrates with shouts of joy in my God. For he has dressed me with salvation and wrapped me with the robe of his righteousness. I appear like a bridegroom on his wedding day, decked out with a beautiful sash or like a radiant bride adorned with sparkling Jews. Uh, jewels, rather. Uh, writer and commentator Jay Preston Eby says this, corporately and dis dispensationally, it takes place as the Lord uh, truly brings an end to religious Babylon and moves to deliver all his people everywhere. The little flock, the true church, the virgin bride is now presented in all her beauty and splendor for all the Lord's people and indeed for all creation, hallelujah, to behold, ah, my beloved, it is a question of readiness, fitness uh, for the wedding, for the marriage. Uh, the marriage is come and his wife has made herself ready. And what does this readiness, this fitness consist? To, and to her was granted that she should be arrayed with fine linen, clean and white, for the fine linen is the righteousness of the saints. Uh, the, the preparedness relates to a garment. I will quote as as uh, uh, it as it is given in the Greek and uh, rendered in the revised version. And it was given to, unto her to array herself in fine linen, bright and pure, for the fine linen is the righteous acts of the saints. In this text, it says, it was granted to her a privilege to array herself. It was something she uh, could do, not would do or might do or could be able to do, but she could do. There is a, one time in the uh, the in life of a woman where she is extravagant in her dress. One time when she dil diligently and a great day, uh, a great cost. Uh, and with much patience and care, arrays herself in garments of particular Im, Im, uh, elaborateness and incrit, incrit, uh, in, intricate beauty. And that time is on her wedding day. So here the bride arrays herself in a garment of her own making. She obtains the material from beyond herself, but she by her own self, her own effort fashions it, forms it, and clothes herself with it. Now, I would say this, that there is more than one time in life where a woman is arrayed with such beauty, but, but this is that special day, okay? This is that special time uh, on, on the wedding day. But notice the words, the bride, a bride arrays herself, which for me reminds me or refers to the mind of Christ that is already within us. Therefore, as this unveiling of the knowledge of his mind is revealed within us, we ad array or adorn ourselves by putting or embracing this revelation into our awareness. So we do have a part in that we embrace or we reject the truths that come to the surface of our understanding. The word array means to impressive, uh, an impressive display or range of a particular type of thing. The word adorn means to make more beautiful or attractive. An interesting observation about Isaiah 61.10 is that this verse teaches us two things. One uh, is that God has clothed us with his garment of covering of salvation. And two, he has covered us uh, 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 with the robe of his righteousness. So it seems that the Holy Spirit points out not only uh, that there was a garment of salvation, but in addition, there was a robe of righteousness. And we know that the eternal Christ is our salvation and is interpreted uh, as interpreted. And, and he is our rescuing from a false identity. Thank the Lord for that. We also know that our mind or our thinking is clothed with the garment of salvation as a free gift. 
all of God's creation are clothed. Listen to me. All of God's creation are clothed with the garment of salvation in that we have been rescued from mistaken identity and reconnected back to the mind of our creator, even as we are awakened to truth or in equal proportion to the moment when we are awakened to truth and we believe or embrace that revealed truth. So that means then that everyone has been awakened to this truth, but not everyone has wiped their eyes and come out of that state of slumber to realize what's going on. It's like in the morning when you wake up, but you don't really know where you are until you're fully awakened, right? And so it's very important that we realize that. Now, uh, in reality, uh, we can be become very grateful to God to the point that we rejoice in the Lord because we have been clothed in him. So that's what happens when fresh revelation comes. All of a sudden it's, oh, wow, yes, I get it. And you get excited and you say, praise God. Thank you, Lord, and so on. And so that's the type of scenario that we're looking at here. Uh, you know, it's 2 Corinthians 5, verses 1 through 3 in the Passion Translation says, We are convinced that even if these bodies we live in are folded up at death like tents, we still have a God-built home that no human hands have built, but uh, which will last forever in the heavenly realm. We, uh, and it doesn't say you got to die to be in the heavenly realm, okay? Uh, but just hear that. So verse two says, we inwardly sigh as we live in these physical tents, longing to put on a new body for our life in heaven. Uh, in belief, verse three, in belief that once we put on our new clothing, we won't find ourselves naked. And I like to tag onto there and say, we won't find ourselves naked ever again. Once you come into that awakening, uh, th th this passage of scripture seems to be speaking about living by faith as even in Paul's understanding, he said, I live by the faith of the son of God. And because we are now, uh, we are of the eternal Christ and it is his uh, many membered body we are a part of, uh, the only desire that I have is to be further clothed with his mind or to have a further unveiling of his mind to the degree that mortality is swallowed up by life or by his life. And later Paul says in 2 Corinthians 5, he says, we are confident, yes, well pleased rather to be absent from this body and to be present with the Lord. Do you know I've spent almost, uh, I assume will be 48 years in ministry and and, uh, and I've been raised in, in church, so to speak, under preaching and teaching all of my life. And I've heard this scripture preached at funerals uh talking about how that that we're we're pleased that to be absent from the bodies to be present with the lord but i would say to you that this it would really say to us that to be absent from any controlling element of this physical existence frees us to operate in spirit as being present with the lord we are present with the lord we don't go to be with the lord we don't are we don't go to be with the lord in that we've not been with the lord uh we just uh, shed this natural appearance or this natural realm of senses. And, and so again, to be absent from the body uh, is to be absent from the controlling element of this physical existence. And, and so I, I do not think it is a matter of being dead, but more so a matter of not being controlled by anything of this natural sensory realm existence. Second Corinthians 4.18 in the Passion Translation says, because we don't focus our attention on what is seen, but on what is unseen. For what is seen is temporary. Everything you see is temporary. De doesn't mean it doesn't exist to any degree in your natural awareness. It just means it's temporary. But the unseen realm is eternal. So here I am. I'm, I'm of the spirit realm, but I also have become visible for a time in this natural realm. Now, God didn't just cause you to be birthed here so you can live a number of years and then die. That was never God's plan. But this realm that fell from Adam's time through Cain, through Babylon, through uh, the revelation of, of, of this book we're teaching. Uh, the fact is, is God wanted you to come here and dominate and be able to share the revelation of his mind to turn people's thinking back to their God identity. 
So this was the problem all the way from Adam through the first century followers of Jesus who had not escaped this Babylonian mindset of being separated from God. They were so focused and dependent upon a religious system that they could not escape its, its control until John's vision showed them the path to truth. So therefore, the things before you in this natural realm of awareness that you know by your physical senses can lead you into a mindset of separation by becoming dependent upon what you see, hear, and touch. However, the unseen uh, realm is eternal, meaning that the realm of spirit where unveiled revelation flows out of the mind of the eternal Christ in you, it, that is where our focus should be simply that uh, should simply be it becomes in its uh, it is uh, its life source to us no matter what you see no matter what you hear and no matter what your natural hands touch galatians 2 20 paul said this he said i've been crucified with christ it is no longer i who lives but christ who lives in me and the life which i now live in the flesh i live by faith in the son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. The King James says, I live by the faith of the son of God. Here's what the passion translation says in this verse. It says, my old identity has been co-crucified with Messiah and no longer lives for the nails of his cross crucified, uh, crucified me with, uh, with him. And now the essence of this new life is no longer mine. For the anointed one lives his life through me. We live in union as one. New, My new life is empowered by the faith of the Son of God, hallelujah, who loves me and is so much and gave himself for me. He dispenses his life into mine. Now, as Paul uh, stated if you live by the faith of the eternal one, then life is never about how great your faith is or how much ability you have to believe. Life is now about how great the faith of Jesus in you is, and it is solely dependent upon your union as one with the Godhead. Uh, this is our belief system. This is a belief system that you can depend on uh, in any realm of existence. And it will never let you down because as he is, so are you. And he will never leave you and he will never forsake you. Amen. So let me just say today, as this new covenant remnant of the eternal Christ continues to emerge and be unveiled to this generation around us, we're bringing healing and order to the chaos in God's creation. That's why it's important that we allow this, that as God speaks to us, we allow our, our thinking to change and be adjusted and be corrected as it were, that we come to a place of repentance, metanoia, changing the way we think. So once again, I ask you this question, are you ready for what's next? Because this is lesson number 154, next week 155, and we're going to talk some more about this and move on in scripture. But the fact is, is that I believe the thing that you and I will continue to see emerge within us is the continuation of the transforming of from old mindsets into the, the fresh and unveiled mindset of the Godhead, revealing sons and daughters of God who operate from the mind of Christ within. Listen, God's not got a new level of thinking for his people. Amen. So stick with me on this journey as we continue to see more of the unveiling of the anointed one uh, come to the surface of your understanding. And, and, and remember, our position has always been in the heavenly Christ, always been in the eternal Christ, never has changed, never will change, never separated, not ever going to be separated from your God. And here's the thing, folks, it's time to embrace heaven's mindset right now in this life so that we can experience heaven on earth. Amen. God bless you. Thank you for joining me today. Join me tomorrow night for Dr. Glenn Hartline on Kingdom Dynamics. Uh, also Friday morning, uh, Apostle Lynn Garner joining me for a series uh, where we have so much to talk about. Thank you for joining me. I'll see you next time on Wednesday morning, 10 a.m. Central Standard Time for Lesson 150.
five on take another look we'll see you next time bye bye everyone